stream. We are dreamed into existence. What we do with that dream is up to us. This is Stream. I am Jessica Deruta, and I share with you my stream of consciousness and host Sacred Conversations. Listen for free on your favorite podcast app and follow me on social media at Trust Psyche. The best way to show your support is by subscribing to my YouTube channel, Trust Psyche. Click the notifications bell to be updated about new monthly videos. One of the things I love most is teaching people all around the world to do what I do through online courses for all levels. Find me at trustpsyche.com where you can begin studying astrology with me right now. Trust Psyche production and music by the lovely Travis Deruzza. Let us begin. How we dream is as important as what we dream. For the what of the dream knows itself through the how. Hey everyone, welcome to Stream 17. Today is April 4th, 2020, and I am here to have a sacred and awesome conversation with my dear friend and old time colleague, David Trelevin. David, thank you so much for coming on the stream today. Hi, Jess. Yeah, I'm happy to be here. I've been, uh, I've been listening to them. Uh, and inspired with what you're doing with Travis and others. And so, yeah, super excited to be getting to talk to you. Well, one thing that I realized, because you told me you loved the last stream uh, with Travis, and I was like, wait a second, you should come on stream. And in that moment, I realized I actually know all these really cool people who are doing really amazing stuff. And pretty much I should just turn the recorder on and talk about all the stuff we talk about anyways. So I'm excited to dive in with you today. Oh my God, me too. Something that um, I'm noticing about the astrology for today that really connects to both your birth chart and my birth chart is today in the sky, we have a Mercury-Neptune conjunction in Pisces, and you're born with a really tight Mercury-Neptune conjunction in Sagittarius, and I'm born with a Mercury-Neptune conjunction in Capricorn. And so for me, this is a big part of what sacred and healing conversations are all about. And that very Mm. much relates to the Mercury Neptune. And so I was just hoping that maybe you could take a moment and introduce yourself and kind of share with people who you are and what your work is about. Oh my God. Sure. Happy to. Uh, Well, so we met, when did we meet? Maybe 10 years ago now? Yeah, I think it's been a decade. Decade. So yes, I have been lucky enough to, (laughs) to be seeing to be getting to work with you for the last decade, and I'm I'm here and I'm in the Bay Area, originally from Canada, and my work focuses a lot around uh, trauma and contemplative practice. So I'm super interested in best practices for individuals or communities who are engaging in contemplative practice. And I think for right now, this it's, you know it's it's a topic that I think is up for a lot of people. And it's basically the question if you are asking someone to be paying attention to their experience in an intensive way, which can be very um, healing. What are the best practices when it comes to trauma? And one of the things I've found is that it, a, a strong meditation practice can either help or hinder people or communities who are struggling with trauma. So we can go down that road if you want, but I'm really interested in what happens to systems under adversity and under mm-hmm. pressure and under stress. and. You know, you've been being working with you has just been a huge gift and so helpful for me in illuminating how to think about actually um, path and pressure and task over time. And my experience of working with you is really you saying, "Hey, here's here's what's being asked of you on a more archetypal and energetic level over time," and then also even pulling back even further. So I was super excited to get to talk to you and. I actually wonder, is this your first stream since um, really everything has has picked up around COVID-19? Yes, it is. Wow. So, you know, I I genuinely um, 
if if you were doing a stream, <clears throat> if you were doing a stream after this, I would be listening to it intent intently. And then here I am getting to do it with you. So, <laughs> um, so that's my come from is um, trauma mindfulness, and then I'm very interested in what's happening right now, especially astrologically. And I'm not someone who um, charts or is tracking my transits in a daily or weekly way, but I'm fascinated by what that can provide. So that's a little bit about me. Mm. You want to say anything about us or? Yeah. I mean, so originally we met at the California Institute of Integral Studies where you ended up getting your PhD in East-West Psychology. Right. And I actually, can you help me remember, like, how did we actually get together the first time? Do you remember? I think, yeah, I was, I had been seeing, you know, I, I um, my mom sent me to an astrologer when I was 12 or 11, maybe. And I don't know, she's, you know, she's, she's liberal, but she's not, uh, it's just still surprising when I think back on that. And I went and saw this astrologer and I, I remember it was a, like a complete life-changing experience for me because I felt super seen mm -hmm. and understood. And I'm, um, I, I have three, my sun rising and moon are all in water, double Scorpio with Pisces moon. And there was the first person I had been, you know, I was growing up in this house that felt a little challenging um, to say the least. And then the first person who said, I see you and I see what you may be going through right now in terms of having so much water in your chart. So I had seen this astrologer for, oh, probably like 10, 15 years on off. And then had I started to ask around and looking for a, a new astrologer that I could work with here um, in California when you were here. And you just kept coming up. People kept saying, wow, you should talk to Jess. I think it'd be a good fit. And I think that's how, so you were in the PCC program, right? Uh, not technically. Uh, oh, I, I see. At, at the time I was doing my bachelor's and I was in the bachelor's completion program. And I was taking classes in PCC and then TAing there, the philosophy, cosmology, and consciousness program. And uh, I was hanging out there for about a decade. <laughs> oh, that's all right, 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 right. But, uh, even one of the professors in the program, actually the chair at the time, thought that I went through the program and graduated. <laughs> <laughs> well, I didn't know that's how you're – and so you were – were you doing readings then? I guess I, you had just oh, yeah. started. or yeah, yeah, right, right, right. Yeah, yeah. You know, my experience is the system that you were working with just makes. I know there's different schools of astrology, and the way that I've, the way that you think about astrology, and that it's a lot about embodiment and practice, and it was just really worked for me. There's a practicality to how you were talking about it, and I still find that on the on the stream here. So that's what got me excited to be in readings. And then, yeah, we've been doing it ever since. I mean, it's incredible. I mean, it's so many different thoughts come to mind, but the one is, you know, around your appreciation for the the practicality and the embodiment piece is definitely your sun square Saturn. I mean, there's just such an orientation there towards like on the ground realness. And, you know, when you said, you know, it's a system that has a lot to do with like task and path and purpose, you know, a lot of my framing and understanding of my practice has actually come from our work together and our sessions. Um, mm. As a matter of fact, you were the first person to fully see me and give me permission as an intuitive empath. Um, right. We, we right. were having a reading and you said, yeah. you know, I know I really like what you have to say about the chart, but like chart aside, what does your intuition say? And I thought, wow, nobody's mm. ever asked me that before. Right. And I think that that really fundamentally changed me as an astrologer and how I practice, which now is a total fluid uh, combination of intuition and, and then that practicality of working with a specific system like archetypal astrology. And do you think that can be learned? Because I think of it like, you know, it's just such a, this is where astrology becomes such an art and a science um, that I know people that have done such deep dives into, I don't know if we call it the science, but, you know, that polarity between really just understanding technically what's happening and then that ability in a moment to see the art project, to see and feel a larger, um, I don't know, like almost like piece of music. And mm -hmm. do you feel like that can be, do how do you think about teaching that? Like, do some people have a propensity in one direction? Can people learn to do both? And how? Because I love that you. I remember that moment really powerfully because I could feel that you 
there was this whole other door of the a room of the house it felt like mm-hmm. that you would sometimes take you would sometimes open the door and then other times not and i remember how feeling how strong that was when you would have both doors open so i'm curious mm-hmm. how you think of that for learning Mm, That's such an incredible um, gift of your moon in Pisces and all that water you were describing, like your ability to feel into what's happening. You you have such a um, somatic way of being able to uh, describe things that are um, spatial. Like you you use really good spatial metaphors to describe things. And when you do that, I both feel met and seen by you, but then I also feel like you're also helping guiding me open. And I think – you know, cool. I, I feel like that's part of our, our really good fit together. And mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Um, your Pisces moon is conjunct my ascendant in Pisces and my Jupiter. So there's often a connection there that feels like really familiar. And there's a sense of sharing a kind of watery, intuitive feeling orientation towards the world. So, you know, a lot of finding an astrologer that works for you is about the fit, just like a, a finding a, a psychotherapist. It's like mm-hmm. so much of it has to do with the personality and and the dispositions. And I was actually thinking a lot, and we can maybe go into this later, about our synastry and um, how we're really good medicine for each other in certain ways. Mm-hmm. But in regards to your question, I mean, you know, I just got done training um, my first cohort of students to oh, yeah, right. do what I do. Right. And it was the most in-depth, high-level masterclass I've ever done where yeah. we went in and we were like, okay, how do you be the best astrologer you can be given who you are and your unique right. abilities? And yeah, there's an aspect of what I do where there's a technique and there's a, a way to practice it rigorously. But actually, it was really about me figuring out how each person understood the archetypes translated them, interpreted them, and then shared them. And what I discovered was that, you know, it's important to remember that astrology is a tool and what comes first, what's a priori to that tool is the consciousness and the presence of the person who is ultimately channeling the information, whether or not they think of it as channeling, it is channeling, you're a medium, you're pulling something through, you're translating Mm -hmm. something. And so I was born this way. I was born as a really intuitive, sensitive person. And I think Mm. it's fair to say that that is something that can be developed over many, many, many lifetimes. Yes. Yes, absolutely. (laughs) And we can use practices to like hone those abilities. But ultimately what people see in me isn't the astrology. It's something that comes before the astrology and the astrology just happens to be a really good path for me to channel and translate what it is that I'm seeing. That's awesome. It makes me think of, I'm trained as a therapist as you are too. And it makes me think about the ways that someone has that call or a gift to be able to work skillfully in a transformative way, in a one-to-one way with someone or a group. And then the, the path of, okay, well, what kind of methodology or theory of change is going to work for me? Am I more cognitive behavioral? Am I more of a body-based person? And then you get in and then you find your gifts. And it's such a path over time. That's why it's cool to me that we have some time in um, to see, you know, I've seen you grow over 10 years. You've seen me grow. We come through, I'm totally hooked on Westworld right now. I don't know if you know Westworld. Of course, I'm totally caught up. Yeah. So I'm not at just hitting the third season and I won't go too deep if people haven't seen it, but just so much around um, path, morality, um, questions of like, are we coming at free will? Just all the pieces that are here around um, how we can actually change over time. And anyway, so I, I'm. it's cool that you're doing that. Can I ask you a question about COVID? Yeah, sure. Uh, is So I'll tie it to the chart. You were talking about Saturn and my Pisces moon. Mm-hmm. And, you know, I've been, I've been, really wanting the last couple of weeks to just talk to you and hear um, what are you seeing? What are you thinking? And if you don't, if we don't want to pivot there yet, that's fine. But I've been thinking about the Saturn. So with being Sun Saturn, I do have a real looking around um, limits and places around, I'd say like consensus reality and what it feels like to individually or collectively hit a limit of the system. And it feels to me intuitively, there's a Pisces piece to this too, but there's a, 
there's a Saturnian quality to this moment around um, what's happening and around isolation or um, certain restrictions being placed. Mm -hmm. But at some point, and again, I don't know now is the moment, I'd love to just get to dig into it a little bit with you about what you're seeing, feeling, tracking, especially that this is the first stream that you've been doing since this all kind of really opened up. Yeah, I'd love to go there. I think um, as a way to move into that space, I actually want to pull one um, sentence off of your website. Great. Um, that is in connection to your book, Trauma Sensitive Mindfulness Practices for Safe and Transformative Healing, which actually I've been on the whole journey with you from when you were writing your PhD to then, you know, turning your work into this incredible book book that you now travel around the world to share with people. And I was really struck by this one particular sentence. And I think it has a very powerful mm. connection with mm. astrology, particularly counseling astrologers. Yeah. So you, you say this, mindfulness meditation practiced without an awareness of trauma can exacerbate symptoms of traumatic stress. Instructed to pay close, sustained attention to their inner world, people struggling with trauma can experience flashbacks, disassociation, and even re-traumatization. And what I want to say to all the counseling astrologers out there is just remove mindfulness meditation and replace it with counseling astrology, practice without an awareness of trauma, can exacerbate mm. symptoms of traumatic stress. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And it actually feels really emotional for me to say that mm -hmm. because I feel like trauma awareness and sensitivity and education is really missing from the world of astrology. Wow, can you say more? I'm so curious about we even we even had this conversation about oh, where there's overlap or where that's where that's missing. And I mean, I, I also hear the the emotion that's there too, but I'd love to hear more about that. Well, I think that, you know, a lot of astrologers, first of all, aren't trained psychologically or therapeutically. Mm -hmm. So right. naturally they aren't going to probably be trained in trauma awareness. Right. Just like a lot of people who do mindfulness meditation probably aren't trained in psychology or therefore in trauma, which is why your work so beautifully brings the two together. Mm. So I would say the very same thing is true for the world of astrology. Like when you're sitting with a client and you're talking about their chart, if you don't have an awareness that the client is has a trauma history um, or might be in a trauma response if something traumatic has just recently happened in their life, which is often the case because that's typically why people come to get a reading is because right. they're in a crisis, they're in a trauma. So without that understanding, we can go in and interpret in a way that can actually exacerbate the symptoms of the trauma. Wow. Right. And I feel like without that understanding, we're actually not holding the person and that can actually um, amplify and send them deeper into the traumatic experiences. And you see this all the time when astrologers, for example, either predict something that's going to happen to the person or tries to tell them, well, your chart says you're like this. And it's like, um, okay, but mm -hmm. I'm not, I'm not like that. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And so there's like this cognitive dissonance and then people feel very confused. And honestly, a reading can be traumatic. Right. Right. This is cool. This makes me realize, I think the COVID piece is a little preemptive now that we're, <laughs> now that we're here though, it is tied. Is um, I, and I'm realizing we've never talked about this. That that was it's true. You saw me through so much of the writing of this book, and you know the number of times I came to you, almost well in tears and otherwise, <laughs> where I was saying, <laughs> you know, I just like bug and hell, I can't do this anymore. And I think there was a lot of Saturn Pluto happening through that whole process. And yes. um, but the 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 genesis or the the kind of um uh there was there's a term in westworld around it but basically something like the story the, co the core story for me was that i had been on retreats uh as in my 20s and had had some really painful experiences where trauma came up where i wasn't held super well not in any kind of malevolent um with malevolent intention by the people i was 
being taught by at all. It was just there wasn't an awareness around trauma. So the book really came from that. And a big piece is around shame. A big piece is around the quality of, of isolation and shame that people can have when they go to meditation practice with the best of intentions and often in a lot of pain and find that they end up feeling like you know either ashamed it didn't work for them they must be broken and i actually hadn't made that connection in the same way to astrology that people would go to astrology in often in suffering and pain of course that makes sense and but i hadn't thought about the ways that you could have people um how one can be trauma sensitive and what you would do so i'm curious about the um you know, you talked about people feeling isolated or saying your chart's like this, or can, I'm curious, what are other ways that you've learned around trauma sensitive practice inside of astrology? Like what are best practices? And hmm. yeah, I mean, the first would be to get a sense of the person that's actually sitting in front of you instead of trying to tell the person who they are based upon what you see in their chart and the archetypal dynamics have a dialogue with them and get a sense of their history and like, who are you? Where do you come from? What are your issues? Instead of assuming that I know because I look at your chart, who you are. And Uh, that's it. It's a more empowering place um, for the client, but it, it also helps level the relationship and actually turns it into a relationship between the astrologer and the client, which, Mm. you know, the thing I treasure most about you and I is the relationship that we've developed Mm -hmm. over the last decade. It's Mm -hmm. a very intimate and sacred relationship to me. And that's because (laughs) you bring yourself into the session and then we use the astrology in its rightful place to help facilitate you getting more clear and oriented on the struggles you're in and the gifts that you have, you know, instead of me like diagnostically um, letting you know where you're fucked up. That's right. No, (laughs) totally. Totally. That's what I, I often leave sessions feeling you're right. I'd love to, I'd love to unpack that. and, And I hadn't thought about our synergy. I mean, I know that there, that's been there. There's a, a feeling there's you, there's me, there's this system. And there is this way I feel super related to, as opposed to just that you're on a soapbox mm-hmm. and it feels, but I am still coming to you with, you know, a lot, a lot of humility. I think we do, you and I both, I'd be curious about where the fits in our charts, but I feel like we do both bring a lot of humility to any, to any process. And you, I don't feel like because you saw my chart, you're just explaining. It's like you, you know, one of the ways we both do, have done somatic work it feels like the difference between you sitting across from me, like literally uh, 180 degrees facing me, to there's a way that it's almost like a 45 degree angle, or even like you sitting beside me mm. in the in a car mm. and saying, "I'm gonna, I'm with you, like I'm with you," and this is what I'm seeing. What do you see? And that that feeling does make it super trauma sensitive um, when I've mm-hmm. when I've been with you in some pretty traumatic times. So. I'm, I'm glad to be talking about it. Huh. That's really interesting. I love that again, that, that way you have to kind of somatically and spatially bring me into like, yeah, how does it feel when we're sitting in the room together? And it's like, we're on this journey together. Ultimately we're companions on it. And yes, you do come to me in those moments for me to help guide you. But it's like, I have full trust and faith in your capacity to walk your path. And my job is just to help bring you back home and to help you remember who you really Mm -hmm. are. Mm -hmm. And the best way we can do that for someone in my experience is in a way that's loving and caring and sensitive versus shaming and pathologizing, which unfortunately a lot of astrologers do as part of their interpretation. Um, They they tend to, to shame and say, well, you know, your sun square Saturn. Um, so, you know, uh, that means that, um, you know, you, you, you're a really critical person and you have had a hard relationship, uh, with your father and, you know, fucked you up and you know, <laughs> right. you're probably not going to really be able to ever fully actualize this life. Yeah. Right. So a lot, a lot of people say shit like that. <laughs> yeah. It's so true. I mean, I've, have had it when I've, I've, if I've met an astrologer who, 
who learns about a certain amount of Scorpio that I have in my chart will really, yeah, it's pretty judge judgmentally heavy <laughs> at like, times. Ooh, you got three planets in Scorpio and Scorpio red, like, ooh, wow. I'm, yeah, it's like, what you must be trouble. does that mean? Yeah, not yeah. so helpful. Not so helpful. Not so liberatory. I, can I ask you a question about the, um, yeah. the art, the synergy and astrology? So I think of astrology being when I have at, when I have suggested that people come to you um, because they're in a moment that it seems like it'd be helpful, and I try not to just make it. I try to be selective about people that I have a moment and an intuition, like oh, I think them seeing Jess in this moment would be great. Um, it makes me think of the way that astrology, because it's I don't I wonder if you it's a, the there's a way that it's a system that is. In my experience now, having had 10 years with you, there's just no doubt for me that it works. There's, I don't know how it works, <laughs> but it works. And I feel like there's a skepticism that exists around astrology that when people would go to an astrologer, whether it's more predictive astrology, they're waiting for someone to just um, go like their arms are crossed and they're saying, you know, tell me my future mm. or it's like prove it versus I'm coming to you with just there's no i have no agenda about you proving and so it has it help it helps me to feel like we're in a reciprocity or we're in it together and i'm curious do you have other people that you work with or have you seen um have you seen with others that re- is our relationship kind of a one off is it more the exception or is that where that can eventually go is people deepen their trust of the system as a tool as opposed to like, you know, prove it to me. Um, does it make sense? Like I'm curious, yeah, I, I totally. don't know the field so super well to know sure. that. Well, not to like embarrass you, but like you're definitely my ideal client. I mean, you know, it's like. <laughs> I'll, t- I'll take it. I'll take it these days. <laughs> <laughs> you know, it's like, I really look forward to our sessions and actually all the people that you've sent me over the years, I was thinking about this today, I've all really loved working with. And I was going to be like, why is that, David? How come the people you send me, those sessions just feel uh, mutual? Meaning that when I'm done with my session with you, I'm like, wow, that was so great for me too. Like Mm -hmm. I grew, I learned. And it is, it's because you're not asking me to put on a song and dance for you and be your fortune teller. You're, You're giving me permission to join you in your world, which is what I do best is like, honestly, merge with you and your unconscious yeah. and feel what it's like to be you and then try to put language to what it is that I feel that you're experiencing and then help you take the next step forward and walking down the path of wherever you might be in a particular moment. And mm. it's really fun to help illuminate that way and to discover it and find it together. And so then, you know, you come back and it's like why part of the reason why it's also ideal for me is we are on a lifelong journey together. And the more I get to know you, the more your chart unlocks for me. And it's less of a kind of a a foreign thing to decode. And it's more of like this really beautiful living language and symbol that speaks to me. And it's like, it's almost like your higher self and my higher self are communing and like I'm listening to what they're saying and then doing my best to to convey that to you. Yeah, I really feel that. Yeah, it's such an honor. It's the best. It's the best. <laughs> it's the best. It's the best. It's really sacred. And it makes me think my my favorite client sessions are like that. Mm. When I'm not seeing clients individually right now, but where it just feels sacred and it feels like we are in a mutual process of discovery i we both come out of the session feeling well used and i think more energized and even though there's a financial exchange it's actually just an honor you know it's 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 so nice when it does work and i know it doesn't always work you know we we have to search and find our people but that's great well part of what's happening in our synastry is you know my venus which is what i love and what i find beautiful has to do with harmony and reciprocity and mutuality is right on your sun and so your sense of self your identity you know when you get sun venus together it's just like often a real feeling of love and adoration mm-hmm, totally. and because your sun in scorpio square saturn now obviously it's such a central part of like 
your work in the world and being a teacher and clearly being, you know, a certain authority and, and masterful at what you do. I mean, you, you, you are someone who's masterful in your craft and your trade. And that is a beautiful expression of the sun square Saturn. And I think with my Venus there, it's like, I really love that part of you. And I feel mm. like part of my, my role in your life was to love you into that part of yourself because that's one of the parts in your chart where there can be some shame and there can be some trauma. And I feel like my job is in part to then sh to show up as this feminine figure coming in and being like, I see you and I love you and I see the struggles and like, let me help remind you by what will happen if you stick with it and work through those moments of defeat and feeling like a failure, feeling like you can't do it. I promise you of the, you know, I see what's on the other side of that. And I will hold that for you until you can get there. And, you know, clearly in many ways you have gotten there over the last decade. So yes. it's, a, it's an example yeah. of like, we can see in part like the function or the role that we serve in each other's lives by looking at the astrology and be like, okay, this is part of what I can offer you. And then I can see what you offer me. Wow. Would you do that then with some, this is genuine curiosity. I'm not just trying to flip this stream <laughs> just on you. <laughs> uh, I love astrology and it's actually been, you know, I studied, I studied it for a while because I would have moments where I thought this is just such an empowering system. This is amazing. Um, and then I would, I'm actually trying to shift towards weekly, um, Chart. I was actually going to ask you about this, about the, the power of getting to track one's transits over time and when is it empowering and when is it not. Mm -hmm. But that's makes me, I never thought about that. And it makes me wish I had that tool when I'd be seeing clients about the possibility of seeing a chart, not setting it in stone and going, okay, well, clearly we're going to be like this, but coming in with some sense, like a relationship, like any relationship mm -hmm. of here's where we could work really well together. But I never thought about the ways I never even thought that you might have done that with us. Like mm. even having this conversation about you really looking at my chart and your chart mm. and where we fit well together. What you just said is so true. I feel super loved there. You know, I'll cry coming out of sessions, just feeling like really understood and that I'm not alone in pain. Mm. And, and that on a more even religious, almost religious experience of meaning or there's meaning making around suffering for me and a, a much bigger matrix to understand um, why this might be happening the way it is when I'm in a small self going like, why is this happening to me? And mm -hmm. I feel so frustrated and you just kind of pull back the curtain and, and get wide with me. Mm -hmm. And it does feel like your higher self. It feels super timeless. It feels like it's us here in 20, whatever, mm -hmm. but also us over many lifetimes. I've never thought about our nodes too. If we have yeah, the history, but it does feel super old with us, you know. God, are you serious? This is a perfect example of you being intuitive. I wrote down a note here. I was like, make sure to talk about the nodes. Oh, cool. Yeah. Um. So actually, um, the sun today is at 15 degrees Aries, which is um exactly conjunct your south node, which is at 14 degrees Aries, and then it's exactly conjunct my north node at 16 degrees Aries. So what that means is, is that our nodes are inverse. Your north node is in Libra and your south node is in Aries, whereas my north node is in Aries and my south node is in Libra. So what that in part says is that the medicine that we bring to one another is where you're going I have been and where I am going, you have been. Mm -hmm. And so it's like we're crossing over and the lessons I've already learned are what you're heading towards as part of your Dharma and destiny. And then the lessons that you've already learned is what I'm heading towards for my Dharma and destiny. So there's this really deep kind of um, karmic, dharmic reciprocity. It's familiar. There's a strong connection. Uh, mm -hmm. I'm sure we've been doing this for many lifetimes in various forms. And in this lifetime, there's a really strong connection around um there's a deep resonance there and yet there's a enough of a difference that i think we can really learn from each other's strengths and and then challenges totally it's so cool i mean if you said that what's interesting if i heard you say that i would think that sounds like a romantic partnership mm -hmm. that you have the medicine that like that's beautiful i didn't know our nodes were like that and yeah. 
there's such a synergy there and yet there's a way with you like when you know lo- knowing about you and travis and this beautiful journey you've been on in your own relational life like it feels like we're in it's interesting to me that i can feel that love and synergy that i think is probably just here in the space between us mm-hmm. and have it feel very clean about certain roles that we're in i'm not saying it couldn't be romantic but there's a way that it reminds me that just because there's that north south node synergy that doesn't always mean that it will be partnership or romance right i mean it's so important for us to remember the um the multiplicity of partnership you know the tendency in the modern age with the mind is for it to make everything very literal that's part of the problem with astrology and um, interpreting archetypal language, both as the astrologer and the person receiving the reading is, you know, I can say something like that's a marriage aspect. But what I'm really saying is like, that's a partnership aspect. It could be a business partnership. It could be a therapist client partnership. It could be all kinds of forms of partnership where obviously there's deep intimacy, a a lot of investment of time and energy, care and love, but doesn't necessarily mean it's a literal marriage. Mm -hmm. And the Mm -hmm. the mind has a hard time kind of sitting with that. But, you know, if I were to look at our synastry and say, you know, do we have aspects within it that could correlate to a a literal marriage? I would say, yes, you know, you you commonly have to look for things like a sun moon connection. Your moon at 16 degrees Pisces is in a harmonious sextile to my sun at 16 degrees Capricorn. Um, My Jupiter is tightly conjunct your moon. So, what that represents is like a real emotional support yes, and a, like yeah. a joyous connection, like really celebrating each other's feelings and bodies and like inner world. Mm-hmm. And with your moon and Pisces on the IC in the fourth house, like that's so important for you to get nourished in that way by whomever's in your life, but particularly your partner. Yeah. Like you, you need extra love and care there. And there is a way that my chart and who I am does give you that. And yeah. I mean, to get really personal, I, you know, my prayer is that the infusion of my love for you and, and everything that Travis and I are and represent for you becomes a fabric of your being on a cellular level and that you too have that. Mm, thank you. I felt that. I mean, you, you both, I'm, I feel like I'm a little similar to Travis Mm -hmm. potentially, maybe my gender, just the way that I move through the world from what the little bit I've felt of him. And there is a way that you're both, you are a reference point and you've also helped me know there's a deep trust in timing. Mm -hmm. Um, You know, I'm actually wanting to I've been meaning to reach out and see if you're still seeing clients right now, but we're booking <laughs> sessions. Cause I was like, we talked maybe two months ago before this whole moment um, around COVID-19. And um, I've been in a lot of curiosity about love, about what's coming. And I, you've helped me be in a deep trust, but yeah, thanks for saying that. I feel that prayer is beautiful and I feel it working me. Mm-hmm. I, I feel from our contact that there's like, that possibility and that task because there's times where i've been like i mean you know this but i'll be public with it i'm like no love's not for me uh fuck it like you know it's just not meant this lifetime i'll just do my work and you've been pulling for me to stay in the arena um around love and which i will never put that on you to say if i don't have (laughs) <laughs> the, the, uh, perf- you know the thing that I imagine that somehow s- that you you set me up. I'm actually interested in the multiplicity, as you're saying, of relationships. I, I'm I love non monogamy. I'm fascinated by the different ways that we will partner, especially after this whole COVID thing. What's where is this going? Um, and so it reminds me of the. But I want to be in the arena. That's the longing mm. is to be at least in the arena around love and risking. Mm. And you've been a huge. Um, I don't know. You've been like the one person in the stands cheering me on. Like, yeah, hang in there, buddy. Uh, okay. So. There's a lot of what you just said, and we're going to totally make sure to like end with this exploration around world transits and COVID and like understanding it because I definitely want to get to that. But I do have to say a couple of things. First of all, 
you have Venus conjunct Uranus in Scorpio in the 12th house. And that's definitely like your love of non-monogamy and plurality and multiplicity and, you know, unique eccentric ways of loving and relationship. And no doubt mm. you've had that. And mm -hmm. Travis also has Venus Uranus. And so there's this kind of eccentric flair. Oh, yeah. No oh, yeah. way. Yes, way. You should listen to our stream where we dedicated an entire stream to Venus Uranus. Oh, cool. Okay. Yeah. I'll go back. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. And so he has it, you have it. And I think there are ways that you're similar in your um, disposition towards love and towards women. Mm -hmm. um, but my Pluto is in Scorpio and it's conjuncture Venus and conjuncture Uranus. And I feel like part of this like drive that I have in me to help you transform and evolve that part of you and to ultimately empower you as a lover is there. And I'm just thinking how many people are listening to this right now are like, um, yeah, I'd like to give it this guy because <laughs> we all sweet. know for a fact that that is not the issue. There are plenty of women and I'm sure men too, who want to get with you. I mean, people are listening to this are like, wow, a kind, sensitive, relational man who, by the way, is like totally getting out here and like promoting me and my work when I'm like, wait a second, I thought I was going to be doing that about you and your work. <laughs> I am tracking, David. But um, yeah, so I mean, yeah, there's a lot more to say about that, but it's mm. definitely in our industry and I definitely am championing it for you and you are beginning your Uranus opposition and- because you're Venus Uranus, that means a lot of your Uranus opposition, that universal transit that everyone goes through around midlife, that really particularly for men marks the transition from the first half of life into the second half of life, where there's this kind of radical explosion of your creativity, your genius, your brilliance, your unique contribution, your daemon. It's like the acorn has fully opened and is now just ready to burst out. And like, Obviously, that's happening through your work, which is super successful, but Venus particularly has to do with romantic love and with transiting Uranus just like, I mean, it's it hasn't even gotten close to exactitude yet. This summer, you'll see it. And I think part of COVID, the other side of COVID for you, as there's going to be a story of the other side of COVID for all of us. Um right. It's a story of rebirth and awakening. And for you, I think a major focus of that because of your transits is going to be around love. Because by the time COVID's done, Uranus will be so tightly opposite your Venus. I just can't see how that isn't going to radically awaken and open up um, what's there in your heart and your eros and your sexuality, your connection with the feminine and, and women. Well, I'm so glad because I've been feeling it's why I wanted to reach out and check in with you is that, you know, you've been setting me up for this experience with Uranus and what was going to be happening and opening up this summer around Venus. And I was supposed to go on um, trips. That's sweet. I, I don't mean this is my nine or what I, I have it, my Enneagram quality of it's so difficult to be in the spotlight so we could even deconstruct how I am in an interview, <laughs> like <laughs> wanting to just, it's so uncomfortable in some ways to get, but yeah, work's going fucking awesome. And I was supposed to tour the world right now and like everything's blowing up around work. I mean, what it, I have huge grief right now for everyone being impacted period. And I think of people in prisons, I think of um, all frontline workers in, especially in healthcare, the economy being fucked, like all the ways that there's a huge squeeze right now. And then here I am in my apartment doing online work around trauma and mindfulness. Mm. And there was just a huge rush around this online course that I'm doing. And of course, like a lot of scholarships that we put out, which I feel great about. And, but it's just, um, my dad was actually a, an insolvency, an accountant who would work with bankruptcy. And so when the economy was tanking, he was doing great. And I'm having a similar f karma with him where I'm like, um, oh, as the world is contracting around trauma and that I'm doing it online is actually super helpful. Mm -hmm. Anyway, I digress. But I was supposed to go traveling this whole year, like Germany, Europe. And you had said, you were like, that's awesome. This is going to be perfect for 
what's coming for you, what you just described. <laughs> and I've been sitting here in my apartment. <laughs> Today's a perfect example. It's fucking raining. Everyone is quarantined. I have families on both sides of me. You know, I'm just thinking I'm here alone and I'm thinking, yeah, well, I fucking missed it. <laughs> like it's just going to go, it's just going to go right past me. It just, and I actually don't know with life, you know, charts are happening and then life's happening. Right. And so I thought, wow, I'm just, I'm fucked. I'm going to be alone again forever. <laughs> and oh. um, I know it was depressing. And then I thought, well, you know, call you first and check in. We do not have to take, <laughs> we don't have to take a deep dive around it. But I noticed the pull. I'm like, well, just work is so rewarding, but there is this deep, deep fucking longing around um, like getting in the, this arena metaphor keeps coming back, but whether I don't have the, 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 the like image of a certain thing, like mm. a white picket fence, et cetera. It's more just that I'm at least in and you were, you kept saying, you're like, you don't know. And we don't know where this is going and what's going to happen. Um, so that's why I've been wanting to check in about, okay, now we're on the other side of the retrograde. Now we're here. Like, okay, there's more information to know how this might play out. So it's a relief to hear you say that I'm, I'm still not like expired milk. Oh my gosh. In the fridge okay. And <laughs> okay. This is where astrology can be very helpful. First of all, timing, as you mentioned, right. you're like, when I say the exactitude of the transit, meaning the first time that the degrees perfectly line up, and usually the exactitude does have a certain kind of special like portal opening quality where the energies are more electric, concentrated, powerful. They're more vivid. They come into the foreground of our life. There's often a signifying event where we can kind of point to this moment and be like, oh yeah, that thing happened. But you know, obviously, like the whole time that it's within range, is operative, but my point is, at least not until next summer of 2021 that it even gets exact for the first time. You're honest, opposite mm. your Venus, you're honest. So you are definitely nowhere near being expired milk. But the other thing that's so important to remember here is that the nature of Uranus as the trickster, the cosmic trickster, is to surprise us. And it is absolutely unpredictable. That is its essence. And right. so in that nature and in that quality, part of why I get so excited when I see that transit because you're born with it and then it's happening in the sky, the special moment in your life is that the sudden unexpected surprise, the unprecedented love, the unprecedented new beginning of love, the way it happens, who it happens with, there's often qualities of a feeling of um, magic or synchronicity that's involved with the connection. And so even though there are these um, physical and social restrictions because of COVID-19, right. Within the restrictions, and this relates to the Saturn square Uranus that's in the sky for everybody right now and will be for the next two years, is that um, that, that phrase that in, um, necessity is the mother of invention. Saturn mm. is the necessity. And the necessity right now for all of us to be in our houses in quarantine is creating a very specific condition through the pressure, through the extreme restriction, which is the Saturn-Pluto, um, the extreme isolation that can be a part of um, that combination of Saturn-Pluto. Mm -hmm. It's like the Uranus piece is like, this is going to be through this experience and in the aftermath of it, I think one of the most innovative ingenuitive and creative times that we will see in our cultural history as human beings because of such of the extreme place that we've had to go to as a global society. Mm. It is going to create these inventions that very much are going to radically open up so many realms of life that we can't even begin to imagine. And for you specifically with that happening on your Venus, that inevitably is going to happen for you through love. So you're saying I'm going to be single forever. And then, <gasps> no, <I'm just> David, <laughs> how many times kidding. over the last I'm decade just... <laughs> have we got over this? <laughs> I fucking love that. That's awesome. That's really 
in that's super inspiring to feel it. I'm so, and we don't know, right? We no. just don't know. We can't know. We can't I mean, know. I was even hearing someone the other day talk about um, uh, restaurants mm. as an example, and and potential. They said, t- t- you know, two or three different things that might happen around restaurants. Like, what if, what if we can't, what if we can't do restaurants in the same way? And then someone was saying, well, you know, there's so many different options. Like we could have um, people with delivery doing a really curated experience at home mm. or, and, and it was things that I had never thought of. And I thought, oh, wow, this is going to be happening across a whole spectrum that we're being forced into that I hadn't considered. And I never thought about it. When you talk about it with love, it's like, there's a relief in me and a feeling which you often provide for me. I can settle in a little bit, but you're right. It's, it's going to be happening everywhere, won't it? Okay. Do you know what I've been thinking about with dating apps? Okay. Yeah. What do you think about? Okay. Call me old school. I mean, you and Travis are Venus Uranus. I'm Venus Saturn. So there is something about me that's like very traditional. Right. And okay. This is what I was thinking about, like Tinder and Bumble and whatever. Um, Okay. Swipe left, swipe right, image, looks, whatever. That's fine. But guess what? Because of uh, physical distancing- that shit isn't work anymore. So guess what you got to do now? You got to go the old school route of getting on the phone and talking for hours and hours over days and weeks at a time and developing a friendship and a bond and an intimacy and actually getting the time to know one another. Right. And then when the quarantine's over, that like really exciting moment where back in the day it was like, oh my God, we're going to meet for the first time after being pen pal lovers for weeks, months, or years. <laughs> and it's like, holy shit, like people are going to be so erotically turned on and so ready to fuck and so ready to <laughs> fall in love that it's just going to be primed. And if you are a class act who's like, hell yeah, I'm going to like develop and cultivate this relationship in what is now a non-conventional way of getting on the phone and talking, which who doesn't need someone to talk to right now? And then right. when the quarantine's over, be like, you get to like meet up. Did you have you seen that show on Netflix called Fuck? What is it? It's like Love is pop- Blind. Yes. Yes. I Hello. mean, I was just going to ask you. Okay, wait, wait. But so, Hello. no, I. This is so. What you just said this is so Saturn Venus to me. Of like, <laughs> <laughs> how good? How cool that it gets to be over. Here's my here's my con- confusion about the Love is Blind thing is okay. that I haven't seen it yet, but okay. Is is or I've I've seen parts of it. I don't know if you saw on IG, but they have. Um, there was a whole grassroots, uh, amazing organic cultivation of a Love Is Blind thread or sorry hashtag on IG. Have you seen this? No. Oh my god, it's super fun and queer, and people were basically like playing the game show by themselves. So people would um, put up an IG video with themselves, but with um, you couldn't see their faces. And then people would match and then date and then come back and report back to the thread about what well, it was like IG. It was amazing. Wow. It was one of those ingenuity things where I'm like, people are fucking amazing that they can do that. Mm-hmm. But my, the thing, the love is blind thing that I heard is that people are meeting. And then there's that moment, Jess, of like you meet and the chemistry's there or it's not. And yes. B.S. Okay, let me break this down. B.S.? Yeah, no, here we go. Let me break this down for you. I'm going to break it down. Go for it. Okay, Travis and I are fucking soulmates, okay? I'm going to tell you right now, we did not have physical chemistry when we first got together. Okay, I want to hear all about this. This is so – because my Scorpio is like, it has to be there and it has to be at a 10, Blah, blah, blah. But tell me more. But you know what? So many people feel that and think that. And then do you know what that ends up doing is it narrows your vision to the point where like you can't have that love that is outside of your mold or your template. Don't get me wrong. Sex is a key primal force in my life. I'm a very sexual being. So is Travis. We make the most amazing love in the entire universe. But we developed, we cultivated that together over the six and a half years that we've been together. And the first year in particular was a lot of concentrated effort and intention on both of our parts to get to know each other's bodies, to get to know what each other liked, to work through the shame and the trauma that's in my body as a woman living in patriarchy and all the ways that I've had to deal with sexual trauma in my life. And that 
a lot of people are not just ready and primed and open to dive in and have that chemistry. Now, don't get me wrong. There was so much other chemistry that we shared um, right. intellectually, spiritually, philosophically, astrologically. We could talk for hours at a time. We love to dance together. We have very different dancing styles. Travis and I dance well together now, but the guy moves in a certain rhythmic way that is not like me. I'm a very flowy dancer and yeah. a very hip shaking dancer. And I like to <laughs> grind when I dance and he's not much of a grinder, you yeah. know, he's yeah, a yeah, freaky yeah. queer weirdo. And like, so, okay. So like, yes, chemistry is important and chemistry is real, but I want to challenge the notion of a, what is chemistry and B, is it possible to intentionally cultivate that by two willing people because our love and our friendship was clearly there. When, when we got together, we could not touch one another because I had a boyfriend at the time. So right. we knew each other for an entire year before we got together and we were really good friends. Uh, well, we, we were friends for about six months of that time. And then we were really good friends for about two or three months before we got together. And before we ever kissed, we actually committed to each other as boyfriend and girlfriend. And then on our zero anniversary, which is actually the moment when uh, the sun moves from uh, Scorpio into Sagittarius, we kissed. And the first time we had sex, it was super fucking awkward. Yes. <laughs> okay. And I was scared. And yeah, I was of like, of course. When he was scared, and we we're like, oh, oops. oh boy. <laughs> and honestly, it was awkward for like the first year. Yeah. Yeah. As it often is. As it often so, is. So, I mean, I don't know. Like, yeah, you need the chemistry. And you also have to learn how to get out of your own way because. Like six months before I got with Travis, like I don't even know if I would have ever been able to love or receive love from someone like Travis. Right. And right. him too. Like we both had to like do a lot to stretch and grow in order to actually like be able to love each other. Well, it's super helpful. I mean, I can feel pretty deep conditioning. I don't know if it's gendered or not, but I do have a I do have a bit of a snap judgment. Maybe it's because my Scorpio rising or what it is, but it does have me feel like either the chemistry's there or it's not. And I've tried to argue with it at certain mm -hmm. times in my life. I have had I had one pain, really painful experience in my 20s where I had the experience that you just named with Travis, someone who I fucking loved. And we just, it was like, was rubbing two wet sticks together. It was Ew. just not, we couldn't get it going. And Aww. it was really painful. It was, it was like, that was a define. It felt like a defining moment of, okay, well, there needs to be at least a certain amount of chemistry. Yeah, that's to, true. So, or for me at least, and yeah. um, but you're to me, you're complexifying it. And the older that I get, the more I'm like, it's not. I mean, my sex drive's going. To, I'm over forty now, and I can feel it changing in my body. I know it's still here, and it's an important room in the house, but it's not the only. It doesn't always need to be the first room. That's what I hear you saying too. Um, and opening, if I hear you, it's like open to really different facets of chemistry. Yes. And as you know, is that fair? Yeah, it's fair. And also in all fairness, like he's always smelled really good to me. Well, that, right. So there is right? some core body, right, there, right, right, right. Our, our bodies are a really good fit. Yeah. Like yeah. we fit well together. We snuggle, we cuddle well together. We smell good to each other, like without a doubt. Yeah. Like, so yes, there is some core level of chemistry. I'm just afraid. I mean, that's why this would be a whole other conversation. Like what is chemistry and what do people mean when they say that? Cause if, if you, if you need it to be a blowout 10, like good luck. Like the, like I remember this guy I slept with when I was in high school mm -hmm. and like, it was great. Like all he had to do was put it inside me and not even move. And I was like, Woo, <laughs> this is awesome. <laughs> that guy was the biggest fucking dick ever and <laughs> such an a-hole and was like sleeping with whatever we need to go there but the point is is like yeah like it was a blowout 10 but like so what so fucking what <laughs> right right no i'm with you i've had enough of that kind of chemistry where i'm like that's not actually what well this is my maybe we'll save this for when i get to have a reading the next reading i have with you about um the jupiterian moment or sorry What's my, it's my, um, the, the 40 year old, what happens? Oh, you're, at 40? you're, you're, you're Uranus. My, opposition. Uranus, my, sorry, my return is there. I think it is shifting qualities around mm -hmm. what's important to me. And, um, 
so it, it is helpful to know again it's just like i want to listen where if i got spun out right now i'd be like oh fuck it's only going to be when I, i'm conditioned that it has to be a 10 that's stupid but i think there is some middle ground of like listen to chemistry and like you said intellectual chemistry is huge what's there's a word for it pansexual uh-huh. um ar- around like you're just seriously attracted and turned on by someone's intellect right. and that you get to have those conversations. So I, my, my ongoing fear is that I'm just going to miss the train in general and uh-huh. you, you know, being with you or talking to you here, it's like trusting, just trusting, trusting there's a bigger piece. You are the train, David. <laughs> you're not going to miss uh. it. You are it. I mean, I remember this mm. one time, my grand, I was really upset and I was like, I was depressed what was happening in my life. And, and, uh, and I was just like, it was felt so cloudy and gray. And my grandmother was like, Jessica, remember you are the sun. You, you're mm. the sun, you know? Mm. And it's like, yeah, you're the train. Like that you ain't going to miss it. You are it. Um, and I see them like we're almost at time, and I'm just like, oh, I want, I want to talk about so much more. I know. Well, we could do whatever you need. I mean, I can go if we want to do like Joe Rogan style, <laughs> like long I, I, form I've podcast. Never, I've never seen Joe Rogan. Oh, good for you. Well, he does like long form, <laughs> the, like the long, quote unquote long form podcast where we can, I mean, we can circle back, but I'm happy to keep going whatever you have your stream. So whatever feels right to you. Well, so here's the deal is like, if I don't keep the Saturn boundary with this, I'm just afraid that the message that that gives to all my clients who probably are listening to this is like, well, why did she go over session time with me? Oh, oh, I hear you. Well, if we, uh, that's fair. We need to keep boundaries. Well, we if we, to, we could do you want to do a little bit episode. on COVID? Yes. Okay. And then we'll, because that won't be like, that's not a session. <laughs> um. <laughs> it's just us like doing a public service announcement about okay. COVID. Okay. Yeah. What? Okay. What, how, Here's what I'm dying to ask you. Do it. Is this what? Is this in any way what you? I don't. Wanna, I don't know if this is too. Go ahead. Uh, is this in any way what you expected? No. Okay. No. And now that we're here, what's your take? <laughs> what the <laughs> fuck? What the fuck? Yeah. So it definitely, I think, most connects to the Saturn-Pluto conjunction, which actually started in the beginning of 2018, goes to the end of 2021. But the peak of it has been 2019 and 2020 this year. It got exact for the first time in January of this year, 2020. Crazy. And then what happened is Jupiter has entered into the to the mix and Jupiter amplifies, magnifies, makes bigger, whatever it touches. So it's this kind of high drama, high global geopolitical thing. Um, And, you know, the Saturn Pluto can have like a connection to plagues, um, mass death, mass suffering. Um, But what happens is, is Pluto often takes things to an extreme with whatever it touches. And Saturn has a component of isolation and restriction. So we're all in this kind of position of extreme separation, isolation. And of course, Saturn also relates to fear. And so it can kind of send us into extreme fear, extreme panic. And there's dimensions of it that are very real. I mean, Saturn is reality. It's also the structures and the systems and institutions that make up a society like the government, for example. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. And so Pluto, when it, what it, with whatever it touches, it destroys it. There's a deconstruction. There's a, there's a process of, you know, Kali coming in and it's just this kind of over the top, larger than life, massive um, breakdown of the government, of the healthcare system, <laughs> of the economy, right? All these yeah. things that give us security and stability in our day-to-day lives. And it like takes us to these extreme states of consciousness of not only fear, um, but also um, scarcity. Saturn can right. relate to scarcity. There's not enough that, you know, this real like sense of limitation and yeah, like st- and that is true. There is a component of that where that's a reality. Like there's not enough tests or there's not enough beds, but then there's also the, the decisions that are being made that feed into that reality, which is common under Saturn Pluto time periods where there's this kind of psychological splitting between the haves and have nots, the good and the evil. So like 
in the 20th century, a lot of times when Saturn and Pluto come together, you see world wars happen, World War One, World War Two, Vietnam. Like mm. these are all Saturn and Pluto time periods, 9-11. Um, so usually we're like going to war during these time periods and this right. us versus them. There's another. There's another yeah, yeah. Yeah. Except now it's like, no, we're not like going to fight World War Three, right? But this this pandemic is often like you know, we're going into battle and it's this war, but what it's revealing is the extreme um, injustices and imbalances around how resources are used and allocated. The people on the top have access to the testing, to the ventilators, to the resources, and the people on the bottom not only don't have access to it, but have to keep going to work or can't afford food or can't afford their rent. And it's just like this extreme wealth and class disparity that this pandemic is revealing all of the ways that the system is out of integrity and out of balance and not sound. And that's the component of the Jupiter Saturn, which has to do with social justice. And, and, and Pluto has a tendency oh. of revealing where things are, are not structurally sound, whether that's uh, in our personal lives or on mm -hmm. the collective world stage. And Jupiter's blowing this up. Blowing it up. It's just like high, magnifying it to an nth degree, it sounds like. Yes. And wow. in March, Mars was in there. It's still in there. It's going to be in there until about, you know, at least another week, maybe two. And that just puts a fire in it, you know? So like this rapid spreading of it and, you know, the rapid shelter in place, like, that's the Mars coming in. Um, and I think that, you know, part of the complexity of it is that also Uranus is squaring Saturn. We're, we're, we're at the end of a decade long transit of this radical revolution that swept the world um, that you can see socially, uh, economically in the environment. Like the fact that the world has woken up to the fact that we're in the sixth mass extinction or the fact that the world has woken up to white supremacy and patriarchy or the fact that the world has woken, woken up that we live in a rape culture. And, you know, all of this is like the Uranus Pluto energy. And it's, it's been happening since like 2007, 2008, but now Saturn's there and it's like, all right, consequences. Like right. it's not, punishment it's just the very real consequences of cause and effect of when you set up for example in america a society that only serves corporations you know or the rich and the wealthy i mean we live in in a in a corporate welfare state where the resources of the working people go um quote unquote as a bailout to those in charge what's really highway robbery and theft and we all have been anesthetized to think Okay, you who here pays taxes? I pay taxes. Do you pay taxes? Your money, you want it to go to bail out fucking the corporations who don't even pay taxes in the first place with CEOs who make millions of dollars and are laying off their employees right now who make minimum wage? Or would you like that money to go to, let's say, universal health care and education so that the next time a pandemic happens or an ecological crisis, um, we don't have to go into a state of total collapse. A pandemic does not have to mean collapse, but it does if the structures and systems of your government and society aren't prepared for a crisis. And that's what Saturn Uranus teaches us. It's crisis prevention, but it's also if you haven't prepared, these are the ways you're going to be fucked. Wow. It's, just, it's a reckoning. It's a wreck. I remember you and Travis talking about that, actually. I think the last stream, I think you use that word, the great reckoning or- yes some word like that that's super that's helpful um that's helpful just to hear your take on it and i, I hadn't i've been thinking about the u.s in particular the way that if we're looking this as a global pandemic the way that it's just pulling back the veil on the systems in place as you're saying and it's no surprise to me that we that the u.s now is the epicenter Mm -hmm. And that the, the ingest distribution is being totally magnified and the deep individualistic culture. Here we have Trump the other day saying, um, which I actually understand where the, the, now the CDC is saying you need to have masks or here's the recommendation. We should all wear masks and him saying, well, I'm not going to do it, but you can do it if you want. And the way that, uh, which I, I was listening to Fa is it Fauci, 
that the doctor of a CDC guy, um, Anthony Fauci, know. he was talking about, uh, he was being grilled. Like, why aren't you making this mandatory? And him saying, well, you know, it's just like, we're a really individualistic culture here in the U S and, um, and, but, but, and the way that the patchwork of systems, whether healthcare or whatever that have been in place being totally magnified, which makes me understand why Bernie hasn't dropped out at this point. I mean, maybe we're in the domain of that conversation, but well, everything. I, think, I yeah. think what you're saying is so important, right? Like you're talking about the psyche of America and the psyche of America is a hyper individualistic right. culture. Right. And what we know about hyper individualistic cultures is yes, they tend to be very creative and very driven and, you know, things like the free market and things like um, the wealthiest country in the world and competition because of being fueled by greed and profit and all these things, whatever. But the shadow side of a hyper individualistic culture, I believe at the root of that is an attachment disorder. And I believe America is built on an attachment disorder. And that part of the reason why we struggle so much to take care of one another is because we're actually in um, a trauma response of uh, disassociation and um, PTSD because ultimately we don't have a deep felt sense to relax and trust into that if I get sick, if I get tired, if I need to rest, if um, something happens to me or to my family, that it's going to be okay and that I'm going to be given the cushion that we all deserve to get life back together right because we all right. fall we all fall that's part of being human it's so interesting we're here this is actually where i thought we would end up going so um at any point you just let me know whenever you want to shift maybe we reserve this for another conversation mm-hmm. of that my work one of the reasons i appreciate you is that you and i there's a i feel like a shared um ethic around making connections between personal and social change that you're someone who and i think travis too and that you you think about the world and we're not just talking about astrology individualistically of course it's going to be connected that's not just like well what about me but what about me yes it's about my path but you're also looking at systems and you could you're someone who integrates and when you just talked about uh, i'm interested in how trauma impacts systems now, I think a ner- how we look at the nervous system is really important. But then, of course, what about a family system? What about a community right now? Or what about a country? And so you're this, if we're toggling the aperture between individual and collective, and we're talking about trauma, how are the systems responding right now? And I'm, I'm fascinated by that. And one of the, can I say one more thing about it? Of course. Well, one of the things I look at here is around this, um, it's an idea from Dan Siegel, this neuroscientist around called the window of tolerance, meaning that any system will have a window in which it's functioning most effectively. And inside that window, we're able to say individually, we can be more connected to ourselves. Outside of the window, we're more dissociated. And your trauma response piece, I really want to talk to you more about that. We've never Mm -hmm. talked about your analysis around an attachment disorder that's deep i really Mm -hmm. want to hear more about that Mm -hmm. and i think this is the the thing that we're often looking at is what are practices that are supporting one's window and i think we need a lot of self-regulation practices right now which are going to support us to be in our window not to just try to be calm but on the contrary to be pissed and to actually rise up and make good decisions for ourselves and our families and our communities. And I'm very interested in how this ties to astrology of how we look at windows and what Saturn to me is always pushing. I don't know if that's right, but it's shrinking. It's narrowing the window. It's limit. Mm. And I'm watching Trump fucking lose his fucking mind (laughs) about the stock market and capitalism, like could not tolerate the, unending growth that is needed to fuel capitalism like we got to throw another log on the fire and even with the stimulus and so it just seems like a huge gut check moment around our window and i'm watching people lose their shit i mean myself included but it's almost like we can't tolerate the pace of slowing down to this degree Mm. and it seems like this is a very it seems saturnian to me i wanted to ask you about that but it's just so deep to watch us rail against this (laughs) this fucking isolation and for good reason but i'm i'm interested in how planets are pushing on our windows or what planets like jupiter are like blowing them open at a certain moment 
Okay, well, in service of um, of breaking my own rule and innovation and change and, and honoring the stream, as Travis reminded me before I got on, which is just about being present to the moment, I'm willing to keep going because I think we just hit a, hit a main vein and let's just go and I'll deal with Great. it. I'll deal with the rest. Yeah. Okay, so- I'll deal with the rest. <laughs> <laughs> the clean up in the app. Maybe we, you can divide it up or something. Anyway. Okay. Okay. <sighs> Okay, slowing down. Here we go. Yes, right? What do we know about slowing down? When we look at nature, when we look at natural rhythms and cycles, slowing down is a key element in any true successful growth, whether that's of a person, of an idea, of a project. You have to slow down. You have to incubate. You have to go inward. You have to have time to reflect. Our culture is so allergic to that, that the entire thing is built upon not slowing down. We're addicted to caffeine. We have to drink it every morning when we get up. We're we're addicted to stimulants. We're addicted to Adderall. We need things to constantly be at a high frequency, fast paced production, forward moving thing. Well, when something is like that to a hyper extent, the system moves out of equilibrium. And when a system moves out of equilibrium and it goes to extreme states, what happens is in order to bring back homeostasis, it goes to the other extreme end. So because our culture has been so based upon uh, quarterly profit and the economic model and that we grow at any expense, whether that is people or the right. environment, right. what's going to happen? Mother nature as part of what keeps the homeostasis equilibrium in check is going to develop a, a pandemic that forces us to slow down. It's a natural process that has to happen. If we don't willingly choose to do it ourselves, it will be forced upon us. And the same thing's happening in the chart. If we don't willingly choose to live into aspects of our chart, then we'll experience the archetypes of the planets happening to us and we'll become victims of their energies instead of deeply co-creatively participating. So in my opinion, three times a year when Mercury goes retrograde for three weeks, our whole society would come together and move into retreat mode. We'd all turn off our technology. We would go inward, we would get silent, and we would use it to reflect and be contemplative. That's beautiful. It's a so natural rhythm built into the, our freaking ecosystem of our solar system. So then that sounds genius at what you're saying about the pandemic. Makes me think that that's so intelligent. How amazing. Like I never would have thought. Where would you say we were flirting with the out of balance? Where is the ch- I mean maybe you've already just covered that with the set with Saturn, but would you what were we tempting? Where were we out of range, out of our window? that this had to come in and then just just somehow constrict us. Yeah, I mean a, a lot of it is definitely around Saturn. I mean, we we have such a hard time with Saturn. It's like we have a hard time with um aging. We have a hard time with oh, death totally. and dying. Yeah. We have a hard time with suffering and pain. We're a culture that's addicted to opioids. We're a culture that is addicted to drugs and alcohol. We do anything to numb, escape, and avoid because we don't have the emotional and psychological um, support and training. I think by the time we're five years old, we should all know how to identify our feelings. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. How many people do I work with who are in their 50s and 60s who can't identify their feelings? Of course. And, And how many people experience something like, let's say, jealousy or envy? And instead of registering it as jealousy or envy, they register it as they are, um, their opinion of something is the fact of reality. And anybody who doesn't agree with them is a fucking moron. I think so often at the root of that is actually feelings of inadequacy and inferiority, jealousy, envy. So the fact that our whole emotional and psychological um, society isn't there, we're going to have a really adverse reaction to strong Saturn transits like when Pluto goes on to it and Uranus goes on to it because we don't have a solid strong foundation underneath of us to deal 
with our feelings or to deal with how to be with, like you're saying, the window. We don't even know there's a window. <laughs> right. This is the reckoning, right? It's like, holy shit, we've been way out of our window. And we didn't even know it. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, this is to tie together the this earlier conversation. So being Sun Saturn, I've said this to you in sessions about, I feel very Sun Square Saturn. I feel very uh, empathetic now in my 40s to the experience of hitting the edge of the window, um, whether individually or collectively with Saturn, whether that's um, an illness or mm. something goes down financially. I mean, the the metaphor that I've talked to you about is that uh, it's like I have an invisible dog collar on mm. and I suddenly feel free and I start dancing and moving. And then at some point I start running I'm like, I got this. And then this <laughs> collar just fucking, it's just such a, just a boom. It just takes me down and I go, oh no. And that can go any number of ways. But what you're saying, I feel so strongly about how we don't know how to work with death, with Saturn, with death, with limit. Capitalism just makes it so difficult that even when we go through periods of contraction, we re- the way we rebel against it. And I do feel like we're in a collective moment, again, being magnified around the Saturn piece where we're, we're all being put in our rooms for those of us lucky enough to have places to shelter, really having to confront, I think, a certain, the way we've been, I think a, che- a check's coming due, um, whether it's around resource or I know people in relationship right now that are really things that have not been said, the withholds that are happening, it's like, here yes. it is. and That's right. It's it's intense. It is no joke. It is no joke. It's it's you know part of what Saturn is is the diamond sculptor. It's oh, and when you right. get it with Pluto, it, it creates the extreme pressure underground that is necessary to create the brilliance of the iridescent and multifaceted diamond mm. that is not only so gorgeous to look at and creates beautiful rainbows, but is so sturdy and strong and hard that it's unbreakable and it can cut through things. And it's like, we are each being sculpted into diamonds right now by the circumstances that are happening in our our individual lives that have been catalyzed by Mm COVID-19. And so this is a, this is a very holy time and a very sacred time in the midst of each of us confronting our individual and collective shadows like in the example of you know think about all the people who are having affairs right now and they can't go see their lover wow i didn't think about that think about all the people who spend their lives traveling and they're never home and the refrain is I wish I could be home and I miss you guys, (laughs) but I can't. And now they are, and they don't know how to relate. That's so true. And then, and you can't, there's just no escaping that. Like it's just the obviousness of that will be, I I know a a friend who was mentioning that someone's sex life was just way off Mm -hmm. and they haven't been able to connect. And then just here it is. And both, I can feel the fear for people that don't have tools to work with that and potential mm-hmm. violence and harm. Um, and then the people were are saying, I want to talk to you about this addiction. I want to talk to you about where we've been out of line mm-hmm. um, that I, I, I hope. And, and in so many cases that there can be like a best case scenario for people. Mm-hmm. I have a question about or one, one thing that's been up for me is about how do we, th- I think of this as, <clears throat> have you heard this metaphor about the clue by four? No. <laughs> Someone said, you know, in life, there's a clue by four, but it starts with a clue by feather, and then a clue by shove, and then a clue by brick, and then a clue by four, and then like a clue by truck. You know, we get these different, I love that, as messages as we go. And I'm trying to assess right now what degree of intensity this is. Now, of course, it's going to impact the most marginalized. And I have a degree of privilege of being able to be in an apartment right now. So it'll be different, but collectively, are you assessing this moment as, you know, this could have been an avian flu that knocks out half of us. Mm -hmm. This could have gone a whole bunch of directions. And the fact that it's 
we even have people arguing like, is it worth sheltering in place and the social distancing? This feels in some ways like a feather slash shove for us collectively. And I'm wondering what you think of that, what you, where you see it on a scale, and then how that would relate to the transits right now. Like, is there intelligence? Are we going to get the shove that we need to, to hopefully correct course? Or I'm just curious how you're thinking of that with, with the planets. Well, Saturn Pluto relates to a karmic crossroads. You're, prevent, you're presented with a very serious moral dilemma in your life. And you have to choose which path you're going to take, the high road or the low road. And the high road is often, in the more immediate sense, the harder road because you have to pay now instead of paying later. You're not bypassing the difficulties and challenges that are very real being presented to you. Mm -hmm. When you take the high road, you ultimately are burning through the karma. You're metabolizing it. You're working through it. There's death. There's loss. And then there's the other side of Pluto, which is regeneration, recreation. Yeah. It's important to remember that Pluto is the, vo the volcano that goes off, destroys everything around it, and then the most lush tropical right. environment emerges out of, out of that place. Yeah. So what we know from an ecological standpoint is that we are most likely headed in a um, fairly catastrophic direction um, unless we make very serious real changes right here, right now. Yeah. So if this is the feather or the shove, then imagine what um, global ecological crisis will look like 10 years from now and oh how yeah. there will be no circumventing or preventing that from any amount of inoculation or going into shelter in place. Right. So unless we deal with these structural changes that are required for us to survive as a human species, then yes, what I know about Saturn Pluto times, and it's important to remember this is a conjunction, so it's a seeding point. It's a new moon position. We're beginning the next phase of Saturn Pluto, which in part relates to things like protecting nature. Um, but really it's, it's like a, a moral test. Mm -hmm. Hey humans, where are you at? You, do you want to survive? Um, you know, so it's like what we do right now and what we do in response to what this feather or shove is showing us, I believe will seriously and severely, and I mean severely as in extremely, positively or negatively, um, lead us down either the high road or the low road. Are we, are we there, right? I guess my question is, are we there now? When you say it's leading us, like it makes me think of individual and social, even for myself every morning, I have decision points and they feel stark right now around low road, high road. Low road to me would be more addictive checkout. High road is more, let me be with fill in the blank, alienation, loneliness, depression, anger, whatever's here. Anger's a hard one for me. Mm -hmm. And if I'm hearing you right, this is like we are in the window of 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 a low road, high road moment. Is that what you're mm -hmm. saying? Like when oh, yeah. we're gonna This wow, is it. Wow. And this is it. When do you think we'll know which we've chosen? And how the fuck does we, that's so deep to me. Like, how do we collectively make a decision like that? I'm sure, is it like a, if half the population really embraces and then 48%, like what's the, uh, what's the word, you know, when it gets to a critical mass right. that would actually have us go high road. I'm so, I'm so fascinated by that. Well, from, from my cosmology, yeah, this moment that we're in right now is the moment that every planetary civilization goes through at its moment of deciding whether or not the conscious self-reflective species that's been developed like human beings is going to continue on and survive or go extinct. Mm -hmm. we, this, is, this moment is as ancient as time. We've been here billions of times before. Wow. This is not new. This is a very deep archetypal pattern that I think, you know, the reason why there's life on earth as we know it is because we're within what's called the Goldilocks. Right, right, right. So every planet 
that is in a star system like ours, that is in proximity to the sun like we are, has most likely similar environment. So most likely a similar evolutionary path happens. The details are different, but there's a point where the consciousness on the planet gets to this point of part of the reason why we're so successful and we've become 8 billion people and we've made it to this point in the post-industrial civilization and can pretty much create and make anything that we want is because that's what happens to planets that are in the Goldilocks range because it's a thriving condition for a species to get to this point of self-reflective consciousness. This is what happens. So the moment you become aware of the problem, like the ecological crisis that we're in that was set into motion before we even knew it was set into motion, you also simultaneously become aware that you have a choice on whether or not you're going to prevent it or you're going to continue to go down that path. Oh, this is so deep. It's so deep. I have to bring in Westworld, but I won't go too <laughs> far because it's just so wild that I was watching it last night, but I won't, I won't do any, um, what are they called? Um, spoilers if folks are watching it, but I'm one of the themes being for consciousness to emerge inside of hosts or inside these the artificial intelligence robots, quote unquote, that the, that the people who were the creators of the system knew there had to be a certain amount of pain and a certain amount of suffering to make that decision. And there's these key choice points in the whole series where a host is being forced into a certain amount of emotional and psychological pain that forces them to come into even realizing the choice was there. And by making the choice, actually then coming into more of a sense of agency um, and consciousness. And so I just, it's its that once again, the Saturn piece where I can, we can rail on Saturn all we want, but okay, you want to fly? Cool. You either need to go to pilot school and get a license. You can't just like jump off and flap your arms. Like there is some legitimate tangible material reality that Saturn exerts that's so painful, but that that with that pain, we get to see that there's a choice. And I, I hadn't thought of it the way you were talking about it, about this particular choice moment. Yeah. But Travis was pointing this out to me the other day about, you know, about the Goldilocks phenomenon and why, why this is an inherent part of what happens at this mo moment in the evolution of consciousness. And, you know, I also, in my, in my cosmology, truly believe that I and you and everyone listening to this right now would not be here if we weren't going to choose the high road. Like I'm not mm -hmm. incarnating to choose mm -hmm. the low road. Mm -hmm. So, you know, okay, like let's do it. Let's choose the high road. And how do we do that collectively? You know, we know that it starts with the individual and they, they feed into each other. And so I, what I would say is take an on honest, as honest as you can inventory of your life and ask yourself, are you taking the high road or are you taking the low road? Because what is apparently clear to us now is there's no hiding from our past. And it doesn't have to be this like doomsday, oh my God, but like, yes, <laughs> there's going to be pain and suffering involved. Not because uh, it's a punishment, but because it's a process of purification in order to move into a greater place of clarity and love. It's a requirement of the death rebirth process that we each go through in our own ways throughout our lives. Like there's no escaping that natural rhythm. Mm. And so the pandemic is forcing us to slow down and move inward because we have this tendency to skip over and bypass the the part of the pain and the suffering in our lives. And the busyness keeps us distracted from that. And our culture is so good at giving us a million reasons to not feel those things. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. I appreciate that you said earlier, the high road is not the comfortable road in many ways. It's the, it's the one that you, you have to feel certain amounts of pain and suffering there to go through the forest fire. It's, it's a good reminder that numbing out, to not numb out 
is unco- is deeply uncomfortable and <laughs> been painful for us. Deep, deeply uncomfortable, and and then it's like the important thing to remember is like think about all the people you admire and respect, dead and alive, that you love. My guess is, is what they would say to you is, but it's worth it, my dear. It is worth it because what you pay for now and facing that uncomfortability and pain, the reward of what's on the other side of that is so much greater, unimaginably greater than anything you can even begin to understand right now because that's how evolution works. It always, after the death, maybe it's not immediately, but at a certain point, Mm -hmm. becomes greater. And so it's like... If I'm willing to feel my pain right now and I'm willing to grieve right now, what I am promised is love. Because without grieving, you don't get love. You don't have to grieve. You don't have to feel the pain, but you're not going to get love unless you do that because they go together. Yeah. 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 I think on that note, we are going to bring this stream to a close. Let's do it. Let's do it. I just want to say, Yo, everyone, David is so amazing. And Aww. I definitely think you should go and check him out at davidtrelevan.com and check out his book, Trauma Sensitive Mindfulness. Look at all of the amazing offerings he has there. You can sign up and get so much information from him that could be so helpful for you. Hmm. If you're a yoga teacher, if you're a therapist, if you're an educator, in any way you work with trauma, which if you work with people, then you do. So, <laughs> so check true. out David. He's awesome. He also has a podcast. And I'm just so incredibly grateful that you and I got to spend this time together today. Yeah, me too, Jess. Thank you. That was so fun. Yeah, and good. Um, feels like of, of the moment. So thanks for having me on. Let's do it again sometime. Okay. It's a deal. It's a plan. It's a date. <laughs> <laughs> I'll talk to you soon. All right, everyone. This is Stream and I'm Jessica Derutza with David Trelevin.